Thank you so much for tuning in today. We'd love to know how God is moving in your life, and you can let us know by going to our website at www.christian.life. Who says we can only have fun when we're away on vacation? During this exciting summer series, Staycation, we will have a great time with a ton of fun surprises in the summer of 2018, but we will also learn powerful biblical principles. We hope that you enjoy today's message. Well, good morning and welcome to church. If you're visiting with us, you picked the perfect time because we're starting a brand new series that we're calling Staycation. The dictionary actually recognizes staycation as a legitimate word now, and here's the definition. A period in which an individual or family participates in leisure activities within driving distance, sometimes right in your own backyard like this couple here. You know, these guys know how to staycation. <laughs> Right, And so each week, our messages are going to reflect some kind of staycation theme. And so the services will be an hour instead of an hour 15, and that's going to enable us to have some time to hang out in between and after services. Uh, but how many of you know that means I got a boogie? But I look at it like this. If Joel Osteen can preach in 22 minutes, then I can get this done in the next 24. Just don't expect me to smile as much as he does. Just... <laughs> just not that happy. I try. And so anyways, what I want to talk to you about this morning, we're calling this bed and breakfast. In fact, we're even going to serve you breakfast. But, but what I want to talk to you about is, is priorities, priorities. The Bible has several verses that refer to things people do early in the morning. And the idea is those are the things that are prioritized. What's done first is that which is prioritized. And we're going to look at a few of those verses today. See, the key to a successful life is putting first things first. It's all about priorities. It's like the guy who got in a car accident and they pulled him out. The paramedics came, pulled him out of the car. And, and he said, oh no, my BMW. They said, sir, you got a bigger problem than your car right now. I said, your arm is severed from the elbow down. Without missing the beat, he said, oh no, my Rolex. <laughs> so the guy didn't get priorities. And so Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now that verse, as we know, it refers to money, but the principle is true. How many of you know, for whatever it is you treasure. And so if we treasure relationships, then our hearts will be for people. And so I want to talk to you today about prioritizing relationships. And well, that begins with our Lord and Savior. If you're taking notes, you can pull out your sermon notes. Point one in your outline is we want to prioritize Jesus. We want to prioritize Jesus. Can you imagine if Jesus had a, like a Facebook page or a Twitter account, how many followers he would have? Like there would be hundreds and millions of people following Jesus, but would they be real followers? Not necessarily, right? Because to, to follow Jesus, we have to be up close and personal. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus and his disciples show up at Martha's house, uninvited, unexpected. And so this is just the way it was back then. No phone, no email. He didn't even send a text message. They just showed up. And so Martha has to drop everything, and she has to start serving them. Okay, so the Bible says that she started making preparations. And so one of the things she likely would have done would, would have been to get a basin and bring it out and actually wash the disciples' feet. She probably would have picked up her house a little bit. One thing she would have done for sure is she would have started preparing food. And she looks over, and her sister Mary is plopping her happy little self down at the feet of Jesus. She doesn't like that. So she says, Jesus, are you, you going like, to talk to my sister? She's not even helping me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. That word troubled uh, actually means disquieted. It means you're not at peace. He says, you're worried about many things, but she has chosen the one thing that matters most. And he said, it will not be taken away from her. And, and so... She understood the, the importance of prioritizing. But here's the thing. Wh which of them do you think prioritized Jesus? They both did, right? And you can't say Martha didn't prioritize Jesus because she dropped everything to serve him. But what Mary did is she dropped everything to uh, come into his presence. And, and so Jesus said, that's the better choice. And so how do we do that? How do we prioritize the presence of the Lord? Look, you don't even have to take notes on this one, okay? Because you already know. You're, you're going to pray, and you're going to read the Bible. 
Jesus ascended 2,000 years ago, and for the past 2,000 years, it hasn't changed how we connect with the Lord. And if he tarries another 2,000 years, it'll be exactly the same. We will pray, and we will read the Bible. And, and so the challenge for those of us who teach God's Word is to find new ways to demonstrate the importance of what's always been what we need to do, Bible study and prayer. And so there's a story of a prisoner of war. And I heard it many years ago. I, I don't even remember what war it was, and I may have told the story before. But what happened is one of the prisoners of war went into the, to the restroom, and he found pages of the Bible in the toilet. And so what happened is one of the guards was using the Word of God as toilet paper. And so he volunteered for latrine detail. And so every day he showed up and he would pick the pages out and he would clean them up and he began to put uh, together a collection of scripture. Okay, now this story actually works perfect for next week, but we're serving nachos and I thought, probably don't want to, you'll thank me for that later, but you'll forget. You'll forget by next week. Anyways, the point of it is, is listen, if, if we were in that situation I guess I can't speak for you, but I can tell you I would volunteer for latrine detail, and I think most, if not all, of you would as well. Why? Because the Word of God would be the most valuable thing that you can possibly imagine. But does that change for us from our day-to-day -day lives? No, but the problem is the average American owns three or more Bibles, so we just don't prioritize it because we can read it whenever we want. And, and so again, today I want to talk to you about prioritizing it and making sure that it's up there. So when, we, when people do pick up the Bible, what we tend to do is we tend to read it like a novel, okay? And so when you read a novel, your focus is on the characters in the story, right? You don't read a novel and, and, and think about the author, but yet the Bible's just the opposite. When we read the story of the characters in the Bible, our focus and attention is supposed to be on the author, and when it's not and when it's on the characters, then we turn out doing what C.S. Lewis said, we feel like the rats in the cosmic lab laboratory, right? Be because we have this tendency, if we read it that way, to fear God at least, in worst case, we begin to even question his motives. And so the Bible is the only book to where the author is more important than the characters. And so listen to this, church. Discipline from the outside eventually fails when it's not matched by desire from within. That's the problem we have. Discipline from the outside eventually fails when it's not matched by desire from within. And so what if you prioritize time with God this summer? Do you think come September you would regret that decision? I don't, I don't think so. And, and so we all know, if I went around the room and I ask you, right, you don't even have to be a Christian to say this is true, right? Even if you don't necessarily believe in God, you're here, so you're at least open-minded. So if I said, look, if there is a God, whether you believe in him or not, if there is one, is he worth giving our whole mind and strength and life to? And each one of you would say, yes, absolutely, right? And, and so the question is, how do we do it? How do we put that into practice? This. And see, the reason that we would say it, even if we don't give that kind of attention to God, is because for some of us, it's a belief, but it's not necessarily a conviction. Belief is something that you hold on to, but a conviction is something that holds on to you. So I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, I've been watching on Netflix some documentaries about uh, climbing mountains in the Yosemite Valley in, in Yosemite National Park in California. In fact, we got a picture of, of one mountain. This is El Capitan. El Capitan, that's 3,000 feet from the bottom to the top. That's solid granite, and as you can see, it's nearly 100% vertical. And so in the 60s, this was believed to be the only mountain that was impossible to climb. They could not find a route or any possibility of how someone can climb that. And I think the guy's name was Tim Robbins, if I remember, or Tony Robbins, something like that. He climbed it. He did it in three months, and he would nail himself uh, to a hammock, basically put a hammock on the wall, and he would sleep there, and he had another guy with him. And in three months' time, they scaled El Capitan. Well, since then, people have done it a lot quicker than that, and they got down to a single day, and then they started speed climbing. And so speed climbers, sometimes they use ropes, and sometimes they free climb. And so you watch these videos of these guys free climbing, and they find little notches where they could put their feet in, in their hands, and they have chalk in the back, and they put their hands in the chalk. And sometimes they show them jumping to a ledge because it's all they can reach, and they got two fingers to hold their weight. And if they miss, they're dead. 
In fact, just yesterday, I was told in between services, just yesterday, two people with ropes fell off and died. It happens all the time, right? And so I'm watching this video, and, and the record was broken, by the way, just four days ago. On May 30th, somebody got up there in two hours and 10 minutes. And, and so when I look at that thing, and I look at the bottom, and I think, man, if you can overcome your fear, and you can just look at that thing and say, I'm going to climb you and then do it. Man, that's got to be about the most exhilarating thing that I could possibly imagine. Maybe you can't relate, but I'm just telling you, for me, that would be awesome, okay? I believe that would just be outstanding. But here's the thing. I got this conviction, and the conviction is that I think life is precious, right? And I also have this conviction that I like being married. So even if I made it to the top of that, Cheryl would probably finish me off. <laughs> I'm just saying. And, and so... We, we have convictions and we have beliefs, but your convictions will always overpower your beliefs. I was thinking about it like this. Beliefs can spark desire, but convictions ultimately dictate behavior. Beliefs can spark desire, but convictions ultimately dictate behavior. So God himself called David a man after his own heart. Because God held first place in David's life. This is what David said in Psalm 63.1. "O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you early in the morning. It signifies what he prioritized. And did he do this begrudgingly? No. He said, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dried and thirsty land where there is no water. I mean, you know, David wasn't playing church. And God is looking for the David of this generation. He is looking for the man or the woman that will put him first, right? Come on. How many of you know God is not a respecter of persons? Any one of us can say that we're going to be that person and pursue God with all that we have. And I think that Jesus deserves it. It starts with prioritizing Jesus. And then secondly, we want to prioritize our families. Prioritize family. And so Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. It says, she also rises while it's yet night, so before morning even, and she provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. Why? Because she prioritizes her family. And we do well to follow her example. And so we want to prioritize family. And if you're married, listen, that begins with your spouse. I, I have this working theory that I'm going to try out on you this morning. And, and it's this, the health of a marriage, I believe this is true, the health of a marriage is best reflected by the degree of mutual deference. Let me read it again. The health of a marriage is best reflected by the degree of mutual deference. And so when a couple defers to each other to the degree that they do that, that's how healthy the marriage is. And I say that because marriage is a covenant. And in a covenant, we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. That's any covenant, right? And so it's, it's true of any covenant relationship. It's why we prioritize Jesus because he first prioritized us all the way to the cross, church. And so when both partners prioritize the other person, what happens is the roots of love and security go deep, and they provide strength and stability. And so my wife has a love language, if you're familiar with the love language, of acts of service. In other words, when I do little things for her, it doesn't have to be a big thing, she feels loved. And how many of you know I want my wife to feel loved? And so Friday, I made the bed. Okay, all right. All right, that's what she would do. Let me explain. Let me explain. See, I get up every morning, almost every morning before she does, okay? Uh, but she happened to have a meeting, and even though I got up before she did, she must have been in a hurry, and she ran out the door, and she didn't make the bed. So I made the bed. Now, here's my problem. I want recognition. Not, not what you just did, by the way, but I want recognition from her. And, and so... What happened was yesterday, I got up for my devotion time. I come back to the bedroom, and she's making the bed. And so I go, and I pull up my side of the bed, and she says, oh, thank you. And everything in me wants to say, did you know I made the bed yesterday? <laughs> but I can't because I'll get the sarcasm that you just gave me. <laughs> right? She'll say, what, really, all by yourself? <laughs> did you Google how to make the bed? And so I don't want to deal with that. So there's no way I can tell her unless I figure out a clever way to make it a sermon illustration. <laughs> My
My, my point is this. If I'm willing to meet her needs, but I have an underlying motive of really meeting my needs, then there's a hook in my motives, right? And so I try to defer to her, even if my motives aren't 100% pure. It's so important that we learn to prioritize our spouse's needs. How many of you know it's not instantaneous? Learning to love our spouse well is a lifelong process. And so we prioritize them. And then comes the kids. And and if you've raised kids, you know that they're out of the house too soon. Right? And so I saw my daughter Cassie leave the house, and, and it should have been expected, but it caught me off guard. And then Leah did the same thing. And the reason it caught me off guard is because I had this plan that I was going to bring them through a mentoring process. And then before you know it, they're gone. So I said, that's not going to happen to me again. And so my kids now, when they turn 16 years old, I start a mentoring process with them. I meet with them weekly. We go through about an hour to an hour and a half lesson, and I speak wisdom into their life, whatever I can do. Because this time is just too precious, right? Before we know it, they're gone. So we want to prioritize our kids. We want to be intentional. But how many of you know teenagers could be a challenge? Come on. And so best advice I ever heard as it relates to relate, uh, relating to teens and raising teens is this. It was Ron Luce of Teen Mania. He said, what we do is we lean in until they lean back. We lean in until they lean back. And so this is how it used to work in my house. It's like, you know, one of them would come home. Hey, man, what's going on? Nothing. A bunch of attitude, right? And I'd be like, whatever. And I'd move on, right? But what happened was I, I, I began to watch my wife and I saw how she began to lean in. And so when they said nothing or you know, whatever their little tried answer, she would begin to push in and she would begin to minister to them and get them to open up, right? She's a master at leaning in. And, and so what I've learned is if we will continue to lean into our kids, they will lean back. It's absolutely true. Kids need to hear I love you and I'm proud of you. And listen, if you had a dad who didn't say that and that's uncomfortable for you, Get over it, okay? And if you have daughters, listen, let me give you a warning, guys. There's some little guy out there who's slick, and he's going to tell them what you're not telling them, right? With, with motives that you're not real happy about. And, and so we got to make sure we're doing that. I heard Ron Lewis once say that, that we need to find the one thing they're good at and praise it, okay? We, we, all our kids have things that they're gifted at. And so even if they respond with whatever... We continue to push in and lean in, they will lean back. Listen, the strongest enemy, the strongest enemy of love isn't hate. The strongest enemy of love is not hate, it's indifference. And if your kids feel like they're indifferent, they don't really matter to you, you're in trouble. I was talking to a guy this week, and he has a job that doesn't allow him to take a vacation in the summer. It's just not going to happen. He's required to work weekends, and, but I'll tell you this, through the years, this guy has still found time to, to minister to his kids. He's still found time to fish. He's coached their baseball teams in the past, and, and so that's what we need to be about. And so uh, let me end this point with this story. During World War II, um, there was an enemy uh, warship that shot down one of our ships, and, and there was exactly 300 men on, on the ship. And they had enough life rafts. Everyone went to the life rafts. And and what happened is six days in with no food and and no water, they were all together, but but nine of them began to drift off um, in in a raft. And so a young officer saw what was going on, and he actually swam over to them. And he said, hey, hey, guys, what's going on? He's he's beginning to ask them questions. What are you going to do when you get home? And he got them to engage in conversation. And and then he said, you know, for the ones who are married, and he asked the questions, he, he said, I bet your wife and your kids they're just sick, wondering about you. He said, I bet your parents, they, they just, they're wondering where you're at. They, they just got to be going crazy, not knowing. And he said, I'm going to ask you to do something. He said, I'm going to ask you not to fight for your own life, but fight for the lives of your families who need you. Right? Listen, two days later, two days later, a ship came and, and found them, and they were rescued, okay? Of the 300, those are the only nine that survived. Even, listen, even the officer didn't survive. He went back with the rest of the group, and he went, gave up hope, and he drowned as well. Nine people. And so what's my point? My point is if it got down to it, we would fight for our families, right? So let's not take them for granted when they're right there in front of us. And let's make this a summer where we're going to do some things. Maybe you can't take a vacation, but take a staycation. And we're going to talk about some opportunities we have for you. And then lastly, lastly, we want to prioritize our church family. And so King Hezekiah, the Word of God says, he rose early and he gathered the rulers of the city And he went up to the house of the Lord. Why did he rise up early? Because church was a priority. The house of God was a priority. Doesn't mean we want everyone attending the first service. 
In fact, some of you second service people are in the summer going to the first service, and we need you back in the second service. But Hebrews says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. And if you're too busy to develop community, listen, church, you're too busy. It's as simple as that. We're talking about priorities. And if gathering with your brothers and your sisters isn't a priority, well, then your priorities are out of balance. Think about this. Throughout the world, there are places where organized church is illegal. And so it's the underground church. They got to meet in different locations and they got to rotate. And they always got to worry about some spy coming in because if they get caught having an actual uh, church meeting, that's possible they could be thrown into to prison or worse, right? Now imagine you lived in one of those countries and imagine that's the way your life was. And then one day the country lifted the ban and said, look, you can meet in freedom like we do in this nation now. You know what you would do? You would rejoice. We wouldn't have to be worried about you getting to church from that point on, right? Because you would appreciate it in a whole new way. Shouldn't we appreciate the freedoms we have in this country anyway? That's why the psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go down to the house of the Lord. So some of you woke up this morning, you said, I'm glad to go to the house of the Lord. Some of you, it was a struggle, but you got here. (laughs) Father, we just... Thank you for this opportunity to gather in Jesus' name. And Lord, we don't ever want to take it for granted, God. We, we know that, uh, I think it was Ronald Reagan who said, we're never more than one generation away from losing our freedom. And we can lose that freedom quickly. And God, while we have it, we want to take advantage of it. God, we want to just uh, bless your name. We want to bless each other. We want to be connected with each other. We're so thankful for what you're doing in this house. And God, would you just bless our food today, bless our fellowship. God, help us honor you in all we do. And it's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Thanks again for tuning in today. If you have any questions or want more information, just check out our website at www.christian.life.